Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. We are on a journey through this amazing book. We just have four verses. I'm going to read them all and then we'll look at each one a little closer by reading different translations and paraphrases of each individual verse. Some translations are word for word, some are thought for thought, and paraphrases are opinion by opinion. And they all help bring understanding to the Word of God. So our text today on our journey through Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 14 through 17, begins, pursue peace. Can we say chase? Pursue peace with all people. Can we say everybody? And holiness. Can we say live right? Without which no one will see the Lord. Can we say, uh oh? Some people view that as no one will experience God or hear God or perceive God. We know there's a verse that says, no one has seen God and lived, yet Jesus came and made God visible. And yet we all look forward, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That was future. We all look forward to seeing him in his throne room. So pursuing peace with everybody is important and holiness. Looking carefully. Can you say be aware? aware. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Can you say living below your blessings? Lest any root of bitterness, can we say unforgiveness? Lest any root, be aware, look carefully, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Can we say soiled? When someone's offended, you got to be careful when you listen to them. Attempt to minister the truth to them, but do not allow them to make you take up their offense. If you do, then you've got a mess on your hands. They can go to the person and be reconciled who's offended them. But what are you going to do with that? (laughs) That's a problem with complaining about your spouse to your parents. After you and your honey work it out, what are your parents going to do? As parents, you've got to stay objective if your kids ever do that. Looking carefully, lest any fornicator, that is, Sexual immorality, it's actually the Greek word porn. Sexual activity outside the bonds of relationship between husband and wife. Anything outside of that is all in the fornication basket. Whether it's heterosexual, transsexual, homosexual, or pee sexual, whatever kind of sexual it is, if it is activity outside the relationship of a husband and wife, It is in the fornication camp. It's porn. The word in our day has come to be equivalent to pornography. Well, pornography is porn being put on paper or in picture or written form. It's all fornication. So lesser being a fornicator or profane person, that's someone that is reverent or doesn't honor God, like Esau. Now, is Esau a fornicator? We don't see that he was in our journey through Genesis that we did a year or so ago. But he did not honor God. He did not live with eternity in mind. He did not live with the future in mind. He had to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die mentality. Who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, his privilege as a firstborn. He traded it off for a meal because he was hungry. Tomorrow's not here. I'm hungry now. What's the the deal? Well, as believers, we've got to beware of that mentality that's in our world. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So let's look at verse 14 from different translations. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The Good News translation reads, try to be at peace with everyone and try to live a holy life because no one will see the Lord without it. The God's Word translation says, try to live peacefully with everyone and try to live holy lives because if you don't, you will not see the Lord. 
The Message Bible, it's a big time paraphrase, work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a glimpse of God. Whew. The New Century Version, try to live in peace with all people and try to live free from sin. Anyone whose life is not holy will never see the Lord. The New Living Translation, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. So I think we see the point, right? Verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. A bitter person can destroy the unity in a church. Can. Thank the Lord, years ago, the Lord did a house cleaning when we got another location. And he told me, I'm going to judge the grapevine in the church by allowing their poison to run them off. And the lies they believed, they took with them. And it was awesome. I today still do not understand what it was. A small group of people had pronounced judgment on me, told me they knew why and I knew why. And if I didn't repent, I was out of here. Well, truth be known, they were out of here. What is that? Am I bitter about that? No, all of them, but one came back and apologized. God's precious people can be misled by one person with a root of bitterness. So we have to be aware who, of who we're allowing to lead us. So verse 15 in the contemporary English Bible says, make sure that no one misses out on God's grace. Make sure that no root of bitterness grows up that might cause trouble and pollute many people. The complete Jewish Bible says, see to it that no one misses out on God's grace, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and thus contaminates many. What is it to miss out on God's grace? Is it to lose your salvation? Well, it could lead to a life of rebellion, but really it's the blessing of God that enables us to receive his forgiveness and extend it to others. It enables us to endure hard times and offenses and disappointments. It's God's blessing. Who's thankful for the grace of God? But you know you have an enemy that wants to take that away from you. And unforgiveness will clog your pipes. The Good News Translation says, Guard against turning back from the grace of God. Let no one become like a bitter plant that grows up and causes many troubles with its poison. So we have a responsibility, saints. This is written to Jewish believers in the early church. And as Gentiles, we've been grafted in to the kingdom of Israel. We've been grafted in. Jesus is our Messiah too. And so we have a responsibility for one another to help each other overcome bitterness, to speak truth. What is bitterness? Well, it's based on an offense either real or perceived. What's the difference in a real? Well, a real offense is someone, you know, really did you wrong. But what's a perceived offense? It's a slight, it's an overlook, it's a mistake, it's a blind spot. It, it is an unmet expectation. Dan Muller says, when our expectations are not met, we're tempted to get offended. So we need to live every day as the Lord wills so that if our expectations are not met, it's fine. We're living for the Lord's will, right? We keep an eternal perspective. So what if my name didn't get listed in the back of the book that the guy wrote and I gave him chapter three? So what? Tell him you want a gift card from HEB or something. Let it be done. The Weymouth New Testament says, be carefully on your guard, lest there be anyone who falls back from the grace of God. Lest any root bearing bitter fruit spring up and cause trouble among you, and through it the whole brotherhood be defiled. Who wants to be part of a healthy community? You got to guard your heart. Guard your garden. Guard your community. And help one another 
Help me if you see me going off course. Some of you guys are awesome. The grace that you have to confront is amazing. That is what it takes. Someone's offending you, go to them and have a help me understand conversation. You know, get the log out of your eye first, calm down, and when you don't want to do it, then you have to do it. Because the enemy can bring things back up. Oh, I'm good now, I'm good. Meanwhile, you've stuffed it back in the recesses of your mind, and one morning you wake up and there it is. Hello, I'm your big offense. So you go to the person alone and say, help me understand. This happened and it, it hurts the way I'm seeing it. Help me see, it, see things properly. And if someone does that, do not blow them off. Do not. See it as a precious gift. I don't know if anybody here doesn't have blind spots. If you do, raise your hand. If you have no blind spots, have none. <laughs> you need somebody to point them out to you. All right? I was blessed with cowboy teeth. Wide open spaces. And often, often I need a friend to say, hey, you got some spinach where you don't want it. I don't get all huffy and, and out of sorts. Oh, thank you so much. And I run and get it dealt with. Clear up those open spaces. That's just a metaphor for life. Verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. How is Esau and a fornicator alike? Well, sexual sin will cause you to trade so many minutes of pleasure for a lifetime of ruin. You risk your health. You could, depending on how wild you're getting. You risk your relationship. You risk somebody else's relationship. If it's an affair or something, one night stand, whatever it is. You're risking everything for a bowl of soup, no matter how hungry you are, it's bad trade. It's not good for your personal economy. The contemporary English Bible reads as follows. Make sure that no one becomes sexually immoral or ungodly like Esau. He sold his inheritance as the oldest son for one meal. That's just It's kind of dumb, really, when you look at it, isn't it? The complete Jewish Bible reads that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who in exchange for a single meal gave up his rights as the firstborn. The New Century Version reads, Be careful that no one takes part in sexual sin or is like Esau and never thinks about God. As the oldest son, Esau would have received everything from his father, but he sold all that for a single meal meal. And the Message Bible says, watch out for the Esau syndrome. Trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. Pastor Olin tells a parable of the young groom-to-be at the airport catching the last flight to the city for his wedding to marry the woman of his dreams. But he's hungry, and he orders a hamburger in the food court. And while they're getting it ready, it was probably Whataburger, while they're getting it ready, they don't start without you, right? While they're getting it ready, the intercom says, flight to wherever he was going, leaves in 60 seconds. He has a choice to make. Get on the plane hungry, leave his money and his burger behind, or demand his rights and eat his burger and not show up, stand up his bride at the altar. A lifetime of regret for a hamburger. That's the Esau syndrome. Verse 17, for you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. This is that story. Jacob cooked a stew. Esau came in from the field. He was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me that same red stew. Who enjoys a good bowl of red? It's, that's not just a Texas thing. That's what it was called. It was called red. 
Therefore, his name is called Edom, which means red. His descendants became known as the Edomites, the red people. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. He's the competitive second-born twin. When they came out of the womb, he was holding his brother's foot. His name meant heel snatcher. Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and a stew of lentils. He probably gave him the whole pot. Then he ate and drank, probably some nice cool water, and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. What do you value above everything? Your immediate appetite or your whole life as a whole? Make the decision there. So verse 17 in the complete Jewish Bible says, For you know that afterwards when he wanted to obtain his father's blessing, he was rejected. Indeed, even though he sought it with tears, his change of heart was to no avail. The Good News translation, Afterward, you know he wanted to receive his father's blessing, but he was turned back because he could not find any way to change what he had done, even though in tears he looked for it. The New Century Version, you remember that after Esau did this, he wanted to get his father's blessing, but his father refused. Esau could find no way to change what he had done, even though he wanted the blessing so much that he cried. Let me just read that to you right quick. This is in Genesis 27, 34. When Esau heard the words of his father, who said, I already blessed your brother, his brother tricked him, He cried with an exceeding great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me also, my father. Eventually got one, but it was a greatly inferior. Once uh, Isaac gave the blessing to the son that had tricked him, he said he couldn't go back on his word. And by rights, the birthright went with the blessing. But anyway, that's another story. Verse 38, Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing? (laughs) Bless me also. And he lifted up his voice and wept. And of course he complained. He took my birthright, tricked me out of my birthright, and now he's taking my blessing. So Esau messed up, didn't he? So I'd like to focus on verse 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain, receive, walk in, enjoy, the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled or soiled or tainted. Notice the word root is there. For a plant to live, a normal kind of plant, now a fungus is different. There's a fungus among us. But for a plant to grow normally, it must have roots from which it draws nutrients from the soil and water. And then, of course, that which is outside, uh, sunlight and oxygen, carbon dioxide, and all these amazing things God provides for us to live. Bitterness wants to take root. When someone's offended you, it's not good. You got to deal with it. I hate it when someone offends me. I just hate it. Who wakes up in the morning wanting to be offended? None of us do. But if we're preoccupied with fairness, that's a form of idolatry because it's all about me getting my fair share. If you're a scorekeeper, you got to let these things go. Otherwise, you're going to have constant struggle. Live every day as the Lord wills. And when offenses happen, it's impossible, but that they should happen. Jesus said that. But woe to them for whom they come. Do not let them fester and linger because they'll begin to grow roots and you become a bitter person. And if you're male, one day you'll become that bitter old man that nobody wants to be around. And nobody can stand I'd like to speak to you for the next few minutes, the cure for bitterness. Now, obviously, the best cure is prevention, isn't it? I think Ben Franklin is credited with saying an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So 
seven points I'm making, any one of them, it's not like a recipe, you got to do one, two, three, four for it to work. Any one of these can change your life. So if something resonates in your heart and you've been wrestling with bitterness, it's, it's, it's kind of like Cain and Abel. Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain was offended. If he had an offense in his heart, he shouldn't have taken it out on his brother. He should have told God. Because God came to him and said, why is your countenance fallen? He said, sin wants to have you. It's crouching at your door and you must rule over it. He didn't rule over it. Sin ruled over him and he killed his brother and then declared irresponsibility. I'm not my brother's keeper. So sin wants to have us, but we must rule over it. And so these seven principles found in our text today are ways to get a handle on this thing so you don't have to wrestle with bitterness. You can let it go. Well, I come from a long line of bitter folks. Well, it's not something to be proud of. Pursue peace with all people and all peoples, all people groups. Uh, I read the other day that when our country is experiencing uh, upheaval, racial upheaval, that the Google searches for racial jokes goes through the roof. What is that? That's bitterness. But the Lord set our nation free from bitterness on all sides. Can I get an amen? Pursue peace with all people. Psalm 34 is an amazing chapter. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. When you see it, go running after it. Just like you would a sale. You see a good price on something, you're going to go get it. Go put it on layaway or something because you saw something you want. If you see peace, pursue it. Now, so know some people will mock peace and bring up the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. That was not an act of bitterness. That was an act of judgment and justice. Because they had set up shop in the house of God, displaced the place for Gentiles. You know, the, the Israeli nation was called to be a light to the nations, right? So in their temple was a court for Gentiles. And they filled it with livestock, money changing, set up a mall in there to make money off of people's animals that weren't perfect. And the money exchange thing, it was corruption taking place and displacing people that were of, of other ethnicities. And he made a whip and ran them all off. And there's no verse that says he struck people with the whip. But let me tell you, when cattle get to moving, you better move. Please don't Google some of the things I'm saying until after church. More people die from cattle every year than they do from sharks. When cattle move, you got to get to moving. So all it took was a few swats, get those cattle moving, and man, people went with them. So you cannot use that story as a reason to hold on to your bitterness and to rant and rave about people you don't like or who've done you wrong or your kinfolks wrong. Let it go. The Lord's got his whip out, and he's wanting you to run some of the things out of the courts of your heart. So that you have space for people that are not like you. Can you whisper, amen? Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. It may take a while, but when his ways please the Lord, what is that? He's taking seriously the commands of Christ. Bless those who curse you. Rejoice when you're persecuted. Love your enemies. When you do that, you're perfect like your heavenly Father who makes it rain on the just and the unjust. Who appreciates the rain? You notice it even rains for people that are against God. That's the way the love of God is. That's the way grace operates. And if we want to enjoy the fullness of grace, we've got to extend it to everybody. Because the Lord loves a person I can't stand just as much as he loves me true. 
Romans 12, repay no one evil for evil, verse 17. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men, verse 18. If it is possible, it's not always possible, but if it is, as much as depends upon you, this is on our shoulders. Yes, but she, or yes, but he. No, we're not talking about he or she. We're talking about me, talking about us. As much as depends on you, live peaceably with everybody, all men. And ladies, that's the proverbial men. That includes mankind. Well, I'm not a man. I'm a woman. Well, you're actually a man with a womb. Whoa, man. Whoa, man. <laughs> Romans 14, 19. Let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do you know that hurt people hurt people? If someone is intentionally hurting people, you know, it's because of bitterness in their own heart. Why should they be so contagious that you catch it? Do something different. Operate in the opposite spirit. And you may be amazed at what God has done. There's a group of churches in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, one of the leaders there is named Francis Frangipane. And this is an amazing story. Marilyn Manson at the time was touring America, doing blasphemous concerts within the walls of the places he was performing. And he was getting picketed everywhere he went. Angry Christians picketing him and trying to disrupt what he was endeavoring to do. Because it's not right, right? We're going to cleanse the temple, right? Well, as if stadiums or temples are not, all right? Well, our nation belongs to God. Well, it does, but our hearts belong to God too, right? And this is God talking to us. So this was happening. This was back years ago, decades ago. So the pastors of the city got together and said, let's do something different in our town. Let's try to be a blessing. Bless those who curse you. Bless those who blaspheme you. So... When he came to town, people would line up at the gates, you know, a couple of days ahead of time. They're out there camping out because they want the best seats. They want the best tickets. They want the best place. And so instead of setting themselves up across the street with their pickets, anti Marilyn Manson signs, Christians took them water, took them pizza. There's a lot of these kids were not from Cedar Rapids. Some travel from town to town. Hey, we don't want you guys getting sick or dehydrated. Here's some pizza. They just began to bless the fans of Marilyn Manson. And this is what happened during the concert. It ended early. Marilyn was so angry. So nothing he tried worked. It just kind of fell apart. And he kicked things around and quit. And everybody was disappointed. The love of God works. Grace works. And so the spiritual climate of the city was not contaminated by his bitter behavior. All right. Pursue holiness in order to see God. If we're to pursue peace with everybody, we can't allow bitterness to fester. If we're to be holy, the word holy means to be separate, be pure, to be different in order to see God. We want, who wants to see God? I want to see God in the future, but I want to see God move in my life right now. I want to see God move in my community. We sang this just a few minutes ago. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 8. For they shall see God. Can you say that's a promise? They shall see God. So we got to guard our lives. And then he goes on and says, blessed are the peacemakers. I know there's a gun called the peacemaker. Please, uh, let's not talk about guns today. Blessed are the peacemakers. I do believe the best defense is the best defense, all right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Who wants to be known as one of God's youngins or oldens? Compared to him, we're all youngins. And here he quotes from Psalm 34 again, 1 Peter, in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 10. He who would love life and see good days... Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. 
Don't be talking unholy. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. There it is again from Psalm 34. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Can we say the holy? The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, I know as believers, we've been, we've been imputed with the righteousness of God. It's great to have our sins forgiven. It's great to have the slate marked clean. It's great to have your debts paid, right? But then we've been credited with the righteousness of God. It's great to have a credit balance in your account, isn't it? But if that's the case, shouldn't we have a life that reflects that? That's what holy living is. It's a life that reveals the righteousness of We have been given, and we cannot do it with bitterness in our hearts. I had a grandma who was convinced she was saved, and not very many other people were, and yet she harbored prejudice in her heart. How could she do that? Bitterness is blinding. It's blinding. (laughs) Look carefully at our heart's condition. Where do we fit in the conflict? How am I responding? Yes, but I had no problems till they did what they did. Well, you still have authority over yourself, right? I have authority. Let walls fall down in our own heart. Let's cleanse our own temples. Look carefully at our heart's condition. Proverbs 4, 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. The world will tell you, follow your heart, follow your heart. You don't want to do that. You've got to guard your heart. Because the direction of your heart is the direction of your life. And if you follow your heart, someone can mislead you. Guard your heart. Proverbs 28, 25, he who is of a pure, proud heart stirs up strife. But he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. So when I'm offended... You know, the the three kinds of sin are the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. When I'm offended, my pride has been hurt, generally. That's what's happened, right? Well, my eye got hurt, too, because he gave me a black eye. Well, that's true, but that still hurts your pride, right? It's humbling. So we got to deal with the pride in our hearts, lest we stir up strife. And you may not want to do it, but your bitterness will do it. You'll let other people... It's hard to be bitter and keep it to yourself. Why? Because it's so painful to keep it all in. you got to tell somebody. But if we trust in the Lord to handle those that have offended us, we'll be blessed. Why is it good to be a peacemaker? Not only will we be children of God, but we're helping improve the atmosphere of our life, right? If you had a restaurant, the atmosphere in that place would be very important, right? So why you would keep it clean and all that. But why would you want to mess up the emotional atmosphere of your home, of your business, of your neighborhood with bitterness? He goes on, Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. So we got to guard our heart. Tell someone, check yourself. Jeremiah 17 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's a heart that's not guarded. It will be led astray. I, the Lord, verse 10 of Jeremiah 17, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So the Lord knows the condition of our heart. When he calls us to have it cleansed, to run to him, he knows what he's talking about. If anybody's in a prison of bitterness today, your cage is getting rattled. That's the Lord wanting to set his birds free. Fourth point, do not fall short of the Lord's grace. There's blessings untold for us. Empowerments from heaven. To enable us to do great things in our family, in our economy, and in our lives. But bitterness will rob it. it will set, bitterness will use your creativity 
for the wrong thing and you won't have anything left over because your mind is keeping you awake at night with all the things that you're upset about. Beware, brethren, Hebrews 3.12, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily. Can we say today? Now. <laughs> exhort one another daily while it is called today. Is it called today? Then this verse still applies. Well, I thought it was Sunday. It is, but it's today, and tomorrow's going to be today. So it applies. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Bitterness is so deceptive. Don't fall short of God's grace. And God's grace gives us a rest. There's a peace that comes that the people of Israel never experienced, although it was promised to them. Because they were constantly mad at Moses, mad at God, mad at each other, mad at their neighbors, mad at their enemies. Hebrews 4, 1, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. That's the Old Testament saints. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. They worked at resting by creating laws to guard the Sabbath. If you look at the days of creation, the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day. When it came to the second, seventh day, there was no evening or morning. Why? It doesn't have an end. There's a blessing to live in. And they were robbed of it. Do not fall short of the Lord's blessings. Bitterness will trip you up. Why are you so passionate? Because I know what I'm talking about. Because I have faced this giant myself many times. And I cannot survive with any bitterness. I have to run to the cross. Do not allow a bitter root to develop. You have to run and get yourself some help. Set it free. I spoke to a bitter man more than once who said, even God doesn't forgive unless you ask him to forgive. And these people have to humble themselves and come ask me to forgive. And some of the people he was bitter at didn't even know they had hurt him. They should just know. So he holds them up to a, a, an accountability level that they can't live by. He's defending his own bitterness and trying to use God in the process. Sure, you reap the benefits of God's forgiveness by asking, right? But the work of forgiveness was done on the cross at the foundation of the world. Amen. So forgiveness is a work, and we got to do it. And the Lord will convict us of our sin, right? So if someone sinned against us, we've got our part to play in going to the party and say, hey, I wanna, I'm not telling you to go on vacation with people that hurt you. I'm just saying, get the air cleared and a fresh start in your relationship so you can be free, right? Do not allow a bitter root to develop. Deal with it. Be ruthless. Who, any gardeners in the house? I know there's some unconventional gardening, but the old school gardening, you did not allow, allow roots to develop in weeds. You were quick to get rid of them, right? Otherwise, they would take over your garden. Deuteronomy 29, 18 is reflected in our passage today. It says, so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. And that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. What is wormwood? It's poisonous. What it is. Bitterness may not kill you immediately. And bitterness can be accumulative. Enough people offend you, you'll develop all sorts of psychosomatic illnesses from it. So even in the law of Moses, God was dealing with this issue. 
Paul wrote, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. If there's a yes but in your mind right now when it comes to applying this verse, there may be a root you got to uproot, something you got to deal with. Don't pour weed killer on it, the weed killer of denial. Just uproot the thing. Get some help. Sometimes you got to get some help when you're struggling, right? So let all this crap be put away from you, and in its place, we don't live with a vacuum, we seek to be tenderhearted, kind. Kindness goes a long way. Forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Saints, we need this in our homes, on our jobs, in our community, in our nation. Surely we can disagree agreeably without calling people names, throwing them in baskets for deplorables, all that stuff. Just stop that stuff and be different from the world. Who wants to be an influence in the world? We have to live differently than they do. It's not whitewashing sin. It's not looking at the, the other way. When there's wickedness, obviously, we've got to do things to deal with it. We've got to protect our children. We've got to pray for our law enforcement and our government officials so that corruption doesn't take root. But we've got to guard our own hearts. Lord, be the police in me. Amen? Surrender all vengeful desires... That's what bitterness is. It's a vengeful desire. They hurt you and you want to make them hurt. Do you know revenge is God's business? It is. It's his thing. He told Moses, vengeance is mine and recompense. What is the word recompense? It's payback. Vengeance is mine and payback. The King James Version in quoting this in the New Testament says, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay. Romans 12, 17, and verse 19 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now let me just balance this. If someone is committing crimes against you or against your neighbors, Confront them and call the police. According to the next chapter, the police are supposed to be God's servants. So don't deny them their job, right? Let it happen. So it's not wrong. It's not unforgiving. It's being a law-abiding citizen. Let's say they're committing fraud and they've gotten you for a bunch of money. If you don't do something about it, they're going to get your neighbor. Maybe they'll get the the widow next door. There's a church here in town that had a guy attending there, and he had ripped some folks off in the church. And a member of this church at the time utilized a person for business, and the leaders of the church knew it. And they said nothing to the member of our church to warn them. So... When he ripped him off too, a young couple, when they got ripped off too, then they came to them and apologized. We're so sorry we should have told you. He ripped off seven families in our church. Forgive, yes, but love everybody. Sure, love your enemies, but love other people too. Just say lovingly, man, we love you, but you are not going to do business with any of our people or our friends. Is that bitter? No, it's not. It's wisdom. It's being a guarding. Right? Render all vengeful desires to God. And final point, confront, forgive, and bless, if possible. As much as it depends upon you, walk in peace with all people. If they're already dead, obviously you can't bless them, but you can deal with your heart. Right? This is Father Sissos. 
In church history, he was part of the Desert Fathers in the 4th century. And a young protege, a young mentoree who came to him for spiritual counsel, came to him and said, a Christian brother has highly offended me, and I want revenge. And Sisoa said, vengeance belongs to the Lord, my brother. You must not do that. It will destroy you. And the young man said, I don't care. I am going to get revenge. So Sisoa said, can I pray? And the prayer changed everything. Would you like to see the prayer? Here was this prayer. Oh God, apparently we no longer need you to take care of us since we can now avenge ourselves. From now on, we can manage our own lives without your help. Before he was done, the young man interrupted him and says, I get the message. I'm going to forgive. I am going to forgive. <laughs> Concluding story. Children of Israel were delivered through a series of miracles from 400 years of slavery. And their enemies came after them at the banks of the Red Sea. And the Lord delivered them by parting the waters for them to get across to the other side to the wilderness and then unparted the waters to drown the armies of their enemy. And now they're free. And on their journey, they encountered another trial. And those slaves were so tempted to despair because they had so much disappointment in their life just fell apart. The waters are undrinkable. Moses prayed, and the Lord told him how to heal the waters. He said, you cut down this tree and throw it in the waters, and when you do, the waters will be healed. This is where the Lord is revealed through his name, Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. Friends, there's a tree. There's a tree that a man hung upon for all the horrible offenses that you could ever imagine in the world. The tree was destined from the foundation of the world to be used for the Lamb of God to be slain upon that wood. Would you allow the works of Christ accomplished on that tree and from the empty tomb to be applied to the bitterness, be it waters or other things of your life, so that you and I can go free. Such a transformation was made there. That's, that, that water was called mera, which means bitter. So transformed was it that the name Mary for girls became common name. The name of the mother of the Son of God is Mary. One of the most popular names in the world is Maria, and in other languages is Miriam. It all goes back to this story. May the Lord transform your situation and bring healing to you. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you're getting us ready, getting us ready for that day, that wedding day. Lord, we recognize that heaven's not going to be a place for bitter people. So Lord, get us ready because we want to see you in Jesus' name. Amen.
An anonymous pastor wrote this testimony. I don't know his name. He said, my friend warned me, I don't believe in forgiveness. He said, God could never forgive me. Well, maybe he could 70% of my sins, but not all of them. When the pastor tried to explain that if we trust Jesus, he forgives 100% of our sins, he interrupted that's fine, but you don't know the stuff I've done. He said, 19 years ago, this guy stole my wife away from me. They got married and moved to Florida while my life unraveled. Later, after I was arrested for assault in a police officer, this guy came to the trial and smirked through the entire court process. When I was convicted, he flipped me the finger. I've hated him for 19 years. He's coming up here next week, and I have a 32 caliber pistol strapped around my ankle, waiting on that day. When I see him, I'm going to kill him. Chillingly, he said, I've thought about it. I'm 63 years old. I will no doubt get a life sentence with free medical and free dental, a warm bed, and three meals a day, three hots and a cot, I guess. All of this bitterness and resentment feels right. Forgiveness seems weird. After hearing the story, I paused for a long time before stammering, well, I guess it doesn't matter if you go to jail because you're already in jail. The guy who stole your wife and smirked at your hearing isn't in jail, but you are. That guy is free, but you're a prisoner of your own hate. And you're slowly killing yourself. Unless you forgive, you'll remain trapped for the rest of your life. A week later, he called this pastor. He says, you know, I get your point. I put my gun away. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in jail or enslaved to my own hate. Will you pray for me that Jesus will release me? Let's pray. Put our hands on our heart. Just in case there's something there. In preparing this for this sermon, I've been searching my own heart. Lord, if something's there, I pray, Lord, you would uproot every seedling, every piece of pollen or fertilizer or moisture that could give life to bitterness and unforgiveness, uproot it from our lives. And Lord, if any of us has a tree developing, I pray, Lord, you deliver us in Jesus' name. If any of us are imprisoned by unforgiveness and hatred and prejudice, set us free, I pray, in Jesus' name. May we go free and may we let everyone else go free. Lord, you are God and we are not. And we do not want to displace you. We do not want to handle things on our own. We want your help and your grace. And Lord, as this stuff leaves me, I ask that your spirit would fill me. Fill me where I've been full of stuff with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, give me ideas how I can bless those who have hurt me. If it's just to pray, may I be faithful to pray. And Lord, if I've been spreading poison to other people, I pray, Lord, you give me the words to say. And if they're extra merciful, may they not get me starting to talk about it again. In Jesus' name, help us to be vigilant and on guard to allow you be, to be the God of vengeance. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The peace that's not based upon compromise. The peace that is based upon the victory of the cross. And may that victory be applied 
to every ounce of sin in our life, whether it's something we've done or something that's been done to us. In Jesus' name, may we live life with no enemies except the devil and his cohorts. In Jesus' name, amen. Go get them, tigers. God bless you.